So our first agenda is digital resilience for all inside into Web3, already is known for revitalizing the computer language Perl and Pascal, as well as building the online spreadsheet system FQL in cooperation with Ben Brickley. Okay. And in the public sector, Audrey served on Taiwan National Devo Development Council's Open Data Committee and the 12-year Basic Education Curriculum Committee, and that the country's first e-roaming <laughs> project. And please be reminded that if you have any questions for Audrey, you can scan the QR code on the screen and ask your question on Slido. So that's welcome, Audrey. I'm um, really happy to be here. I'm honored to be invited here. Uh, I'm Audrey Tonto as Digital Minister. Uh, I'm on Ethereum as Audrey uh, and on Tezos uh, as Audrey T. Uh, and uh, uh, today I'm going to answer Slido questions because I was just told uh, that for the next 20 minutes or so, uh, there's a lot of very interesting uh, questions already uh, from the audience, and some of them has been posted on Slido. So I will just, um, instead of reading our script, uh, to read from Slido, and, uh, which goes like this. The top question asks, the government is centralized, but Web3 is decentralized. So how to balance between centralization and decentralization? Um, it's not quite accurate to say government is centralized. Only authoritarian governments are centralized, and the dictatorships are totally centralized. Uh, but in a democracy, uh, the government is designed with checks and balances. So it's what we call a polycentered design. For example, the judicial branch, the legislative branch, and the administration are usually three different branches. So only three centers, fully centered. Uh, whereas, of course, in our country, there's five branches. But in any case, uh, the government is designed also to work with municipalities. And the municipal government also has the capability to build their own rules. So in that sense, it is also a fully centered approach. So Web3 is quite useful uh, for democratic governments because it increased the possibility for innovation. Um, as many of you know, here in Taiwan, early on, uh, in early 2020, we opened up the real-time inventory of all the mask uh, rationing in all the pharmacies and later on convenience stores. And more than 100 different applications sprung up because of this shared ledger. Every developer knows that there's at least some 100 other developers that has exactly the same copy of the availability of mass and later on rapid testing and things like that. And so because of that, nobody has the motivation to tamper with this shared ledger because they will be discovered very quickly. And so that is the same idea really as Web3, where very, uh, there's a lot of people who host the same sort of ledgers can cross-verify each other and that reduces the incentive for tampering. But it's not just that. Based on the decentralized common knowledge, that is to say, I not only know you have a copy, I know you know I have a copy, and I know that you have a copy. Based on this idea of common knowledge, uh, we can then do coordinations that was previously not possible under authoritarian governments. For example, my ministry uh, has this idea of uh, the public benefits uh, data-based, non-personal data-based innovation. It's an open call for anyone to go to 100.api administration of digital industries, .gov, .tw, and anyone can say, oh, I have this great idea that doesn't involve uh, processing of personal data in a centralized manner, but rather we use PETs, uh, privacy enhancing technologies, uh, like zero knowledge, homomorphic encryption, and things like that. And so, for example, we can provide automated uh, sign language translation for people with hearing and speaking uh, challenges, uh, and sign language is uh, one of the national languages in Taiwan, by the way. So it also uh, spreads its culture and so on. Now, to build that translation service in a centralized way would necessarily mean that an AI provider will actually eavesdrop into all the conversations uh, between people and the people who need interpretation. But using the latest multi-policy computing, zero knowledge, uh, homomorphic encryption, and so on, the latest PETs, we can't actually train that AI to gather without any process of getting any insight into the underlying raw data. So the contribution of the code 
is brought to the data instead of asking data to come to the code. And that, again, is a core Web3 idea. It's a composability of a public code that everybody can then uh, encrypt their data but still work with a common code. And uh, if you enroll into the 100.ADI uh, competition, uh, very interestingly, you will be asked to work with crowdfunding uh, people to secure some donations for your project. And you will be told that you will get a matching grant from the Ministry of Digital Affairs only if the sum of the square root of all the contributions to your crowdfunding is larger than your competitors. Now, this is called quadratic funding. And again, this is something that is only possible in a uh, common knowledge mode where everybody knows that everybody else is contributing to this and commons so that we can calculate not in a traditional matching grant just for people who actually can take a loan or something to get the government matching fund, uh, but instead have to prove that there's at least these many people uh, who individually all consider this project as important. Now, to uh, anyone who want to gain the system, understand like a e-petition or an e-signature, if anyone can manufacture like 5,000 identities uh, like overnight, then it is impossible then for us to know whether it's the quadratic funding sphere or not. So it is true that there is one centralizing force at play here in this decentralized uh, world that I just described, this plurality world, and that is identity. Uh, we do rely on FIDO, uh, on the uh, citizen's digital certificate and other identity providers like telecoms and so on to verify that it is actually a citizen participating in this quadratic funding. And so this is like what 2.5 or something is a bridge uh, between the Electronic Signature Act, which uh, is also the purview of MODA, with the decentralized world. But the decentralized world is like our lab that tries to democratize more and more public services. And at the moment, the root of trust is still at the PKI, uh, at the MODA and the Ministry of Interior. But in the future, we can easily think about cooperating with other sovereign countries like the IDAs and so on for cooperability and interoperability. So this is my take on the relationship uh, between the centralizing force and the decentralizing force. But we're democracies, so we'll become more and more decentralized. Um, the next question asks, what is the government's policy uh, to go uh, to the Web3 age? Uh, I, I cannot speak for all of governments, but at least in MODA, uh, we do have a guideline. And that is a book uh, that I'm writing uh, with Glenn Weil. It's at uh, plurality.net. And in the book, uh, we outline the sort of direction that we want to take, and it's called plurality. Uh, plurality means collaboration across diversity. So it's not collaboration by harmonizing uh, everyone so that people only follow uh, the same ideology, but it's not people going so divisive and polarized against each other. And one of the uh, recent implementation of the plurality idea is actually found in Elon Musk's uh, company called Twitter. Maybe you have heard of Twitter. Um, so on Twitter, if you uh, see Elon Musk or somebody post something that is controversial, uh, chances are you will see a community note. It's a mandatory footnote that you cannot uh, avoid retweeting. You cannot just retweet that tweet without retweeting also the community note. And community note is again selected with something like quadratic funding, except this time it uses a rigid algorithm that calculates uh, the most likely common uh, understanding, a good enough consensus across the polarized ideologies on Twitter. In other words, it's a measurement of bipartisanship, it's a measurement of plurality. If a community note gets the like from the people who normally don't like each other, then it's more likely that the community note will surface. And this is again something we have prototyped in Taiwan uh, as part of the V-Taiwan uh, experiment in 2015 using the police algorithm. Uh, the community notes team, previously known as Birdwatch, uh, is kind enough to share as common code on GitHub all the algorithms and papers and things like that. And there's a direct lineage from our experience in 2015 from Polis and computational democracy all the way to Birdwatch and then now to community notes. So we are committed to develop and invest in more collaborative technologies like this that brings people together across 
those different communities instead of asking the community to adapt to digital transformation that is not what we're doing. So uh, the next question goes, um, so uh, is the role that uh, trying to invent uh, our own public chain uh, so that you can do you know, dollar moda or something, right? <laughs> but we're not uh, issuing dollar moda at this moment. Uh, and, and the reason why is actually quite practical. There are already uh, collaboration chains between the different branches of the government, uh, the financial ones, of course, but also for the judicial ones, right? For uh, the evidence uh, in a criminal investigation, different branches, including the judicial and the administration, and the different uh, agencies within the administration need to set up a collaborative chain uh, with uh, a odd number, like seven or nine uh, of uh, peers, uh, so as to mutually authenticate each other. And this is the sort of innovation that we're promoting. That is to say, take the innovations from the public chain world and then apply its spirit, but not necessarily its code, uh, to, as I mentioned, quadratic voting, quadratic funding, and this kind of collaborative uh, like alliance chains. And so this is the step work we're taking at the moment, but we are, of course, very open to work with any public chain providers that satisfy this kind of uh, plurality-based innovation. So uh, the next one uh, asks, so can the Moda do more infrastructure or a common service? For example, can we run a blockchain node service or Oracle services? Uh, so I understand this is the um, uh, blockchain oracle, not that oracle, uh, or on-chain data analysis uh, for Taiwan startups. So these are all very good ideas. And uh, the, the great thing about Moda is that we are multi-stakeholder. Uh, we have a deposit of democracy network, Minzhu uh, Wang that builds uh, relationships with not just other sovereign countries, but also decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, we have a section dedicated for decentralized autonomous organizations, the Duo Yuan uh, Interoperable Metaverses section. Uh, and so uh, you're, you're all welcome uh, to work with the Democracy Network. I think they're setting up monthly gatherings and multi stakeholder panels and so on, so that we can commit uh, to each other. This is like a shelling point, right? People discover each other very naturally, very easily, and so that we can develop the sort of services. But of course, if you uh, do not want to wait uh, for uh, consensus for that to be reached uh, in a blueprint or something like that, you can just go ahead and do that. And we have a lot of activities, not just the 100.ADI uh, project funding, but also uh, the presidential hackathon, the ideas on and so on. There are many, many uh, platforms on top of which for your idea uh, to, to gain foothold and to gain the hearts and minds of career public servants. So, um, there's a question that says, um, so in your position, what can we do to promote uh, Taiwan's web free token economy? So um, this is a real good question. Uh, in designing the 100.ADI activity, we asked each uh, project eligible for the quadratic funding must declare that its innovation solved at least one of the 17 sustainable development goals. And they have to be very specific as in which indicator or which target, there are 169 of these. Which target are you trying to improve in a measurable way? Because at the end of the day, the truth of the matter is that the government exists to promote public benefits, the public good. And public goods, the international measurement is the SDGs. So if you can say, oh, the Minister of Health and Welfare is already committed on um, these and these SDGs, and I will just take one target or one indicator from the SDGs that the MOHW is committing to improve anyway, but I can prove that with my great web free idea, with the same amount of investment, it can reach 10 times more people, or it can provide 10 times better service to save time and so on. By calculating the time and the cost and the number of visits, you can prove to the MOHW that your idea has a higher social return on investment, or SROI. And with the SROI, that unlocks um, the idea of retroactive funding, right? So not just quadratic funding, uh, which is funded the whole but ra rather the idea of a kind of 
impact certificate that leads to impact investments that could be issued as an impact bond and so on. And there's a lot of social entrepreneurs in Taiwan that already know how to work with the SROI uh, industry because of our previous commitments um, net zero carbon emission and things like that. And so think about the utility of your projects, not necessarily about carbon emission, although that's probably easier to calculate among all the SDGs, uh, but try to calculate it anyway and to align it with one or more of the targets of the SDGs that any other ministry, not just MoDA, have committed to improve. And then our job will be introducing your innovation first to the MoDA public servants. We will use, use your uh, service first, right? And then uh, you will be on this uh, common uh, software procurement platform, the and once you are on that platform, we will introduce the Ministry of Health and Welfare or any ministry that is taking interest to your services so that you can also provide public digital infrastructure the same way that the conspiration in map and contact tracing through 192 to SMS was the uh, public infrastructure that was used by tens of millions of people during the pandemic times. So that answer the question. So, um, I have the, only a couple of minutes left. Um, so, the next uh, highest voted question is, do we have a SBIR uh, that supports uh, for Web3 or digital twins or things like that? Well, the good thing is that all the existing um, projects, uh, even the Chu the public-private partnership, and, and so on, nowadays includes digital infrastructure in the definition of infrastructure. That was not the case in 2015, where or a Jichu Jianshe basic infrastructure means something made out of concrete, like something concrete. Uh, starting in 2016, uh, we started redefining the term. So nowadays, things made of bits are totally qualified for infrastructure budget. So you do not have to seek to carve out a special kind of Web3 or digital or whatever track. You can just look at the infrastructure budget and then say, oh, this infrastructure project, the kind of benefit that it tries to deliver, we can augment or amplify it in a way that uses Web3 technology, but with the public benefit that was declared by the original tender or procurement uh, for that public infrastructure. So think about building Web3 as a public infrastructure that work with the people, not just for the people, would be my recommendation. And thank you for all your great questions. Live long and prosper. Thank you all. I hope that Orbit has answered some of the questions because we have so many questions popping up on Slido. But thank you so much for participating in this event. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I really need to write, so. <laughs> <laughs>